in, instead of talking about you know painting by painting, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my, what it's like as it, to be an artist, the life of an artist. Um, I'm going to start with a little story. Uh, the the uh, astrophysicist Niels Bohr, uh, the Danish uh, physicist. This is an untrue story, by the way. Um, <laughs> was asked by the U.S. government uh, in the in the late '50s to go around the country and talk about uh, atomic power, the benefits of atomic power, to talk about it with lay people and explain it in a very clear, cohesive way. They hired him, they gave him a driver uh, with a chauffeur's cap, and the two of them hit the road and they went campus by campus around the country doing these talks. And after about three or four of the talks, uh, they became friends and eventually uh, Niels moved up into the front seat so they could get to know each other better. And after a few more weeks of the talks, he went, said to the driver, he said, um, you know, you've seen me do this a lot, and it's pretty much the same talk each time. I bet you could do it yourself. And the driver said, yeah, I probably could. And he said, so why don't we try something? So the driver took the cap off, put it on Niels Bohr. Niels stood in the back of the auditorium, and the driver, as Niels Bohr, stood on stage and delivered the talks. They did it night after night after night <laughs> with great success until one night when a college professor asked a really multi-layered, complex question about, you know, string theory. And uh, the driver, <laughs> posing as Niels Bohr on stage, said, oh, that, that is a, such a stupid question. I'm not even going to dignify that. <laughs> <laughs> My driver can answer that question. <laughs> and then he came up and answered it. And the, the reason I tell that story is, is to illustrate that an artist has to be two people in the same body. Uh, a creator and a driver. Uh, a maker and a talker. Um, I think it's very important for an artist to learn how to brand themselves. Uh, to learn to write about their work concisely and to learn how to stand in front of people and talk about what it is they're trying to do. And report to them two things. This is what I do and this is how I do it. If, if you're a creator, if you're an artist, you work in show business, and there is one show business, in my opinion. Doesn't matter if you, if you juggle balls, or you uh, write string quartets, or you, you swallow knives, or you make paintings. All of us work in show business, and it is one show business. And like any business, show business thrives on consumption, as crass as that sounds. Yet our product, for lack of a better word, is the gift of anti-speed. We offer the world, obsessed with velocity, the gift of slow seeing and slow thinking. And I think that's one of the most sublime gifts that one human being can give another. Um, when my daughter was about seven, she was falling asleep and she had lost a tooth and it was in an envelope under her pillow. And we were laying there and I was rubbing her back as I do every night and she said, Daddy, tell me the truth, are you the tooth fairy? And I said, I, I didn't want to lie to her, so I said, yes, honey, I am the tooth fairy. And then she thought for a minute and she said, you mean you go all over the world and get the tooth fairy? <laughs> um, and it was, it was such a beautiful moment because each of us saw the same thing from very, two very distinct viewpoints. What seemed trivial and immature to me was rich and spacious to her. And I think that's part of what we do as painters. We try to restore the spaciousness of childhood. Um, uh, I think that art brings us back into ourselves by first making us unrecognizable to ourselves. We are seeing the world through someone else's eyes. Uh, I come from the coast of South Carolina. I was born and raised in Myrtle Beach. Uh, humidity made me a painter. I was raised in the mind-numbing heat of the low country. Uh, my first lessons in painting were walking along ancient riverbanks. Uh, feeling pluff mud squirt between my toes as I ambled from one viewpoint to another, desperate to contain it in any way I could. I had no idea what an artist was. Um, long before I had any conception of painting, I would take big heaps of pluff mud out of the marsh, splat it down on the dock in the hot sun, and then I would arrange little pieces of colored construction paper on the muck, and then take another layer of slime and put it over it, and I would grab an oyster shell and take that and sort of carve away bits of it to reveal layers of color of different intensities. And what I realized all these decades later is how the directness and the simplicity of that experience taught me about how a painting comes into being in the first place. Painting, in my opinion, is the enactment of place. You can't think a painting, you have to make a painting. A painting is simply crushed rock mixed with liquefied <coughs> fat and smeared on a surface. So that was my first lesson, my first uh, <coughs> glimpse into what, what I could do with my hands. That's the way that I understand the world, is from that very tactile, 
very local viewpoint. Everything I needed to do those experiments was under my feet. Mud and oyster shells and paper, which I brought. Um, uh, as a child of the coast, I was taught to drink in all of the details of the local landscape. Um, a flower, it's not just a flower, but it's blue water hyssop or southern marsh canna. Uh, barbecue sauce is, is heavy tomato or light tomato, mustard base or vinegar base. Beauty lives in the details, and a painter's job is to magnify details. So I always felt like I never needed a position in my work because I have a place, and that place is the geography of where I come from. Um, I, I, it has, it, I moved to uh, New York City uh, to go to graduate school right out of college, 1987, out of the College of Charleston where I attended. Uh, so I moved uh, to New York uh, literally the day after I got out of the College of Charleston. And to this day, my, my, the source of my work, the, the chassis of my work, is that, that initial learning how to see in the low country of South Carolina. That's the tether that runs from the, the softest tissue inside of me directly into the work. And it has nothing to do with memory. Um, memory and nostalgia, I think, sells it far too short. What the South taught me was the ability to gradually construct my far-seeing place. And I think that's what every artist needs, is their own far-seeing place. And to access it, all you need are two things. You need a door, and you need a lock on the door. And I can't overstate the importance of having a locked door for a painter, where you can go and make mistakes. You can, make, you can fail, fail gloriously, and the world never sees it. Um, I think it's also important for an artist to narrow their job description. I love limited perspectives of any kind. Uh, I narrow my job description down as much as I can. Every day I ask myself, what, what's my job? Uh, I'm not an artist. That, that doesn't mean anything anymore to me. Uh, I'm not even a painter. Um, I'm not even a landscape painter. I'm a southern landscape painter who lives and works in New York City. I, have to, I, I find that the more specific my job description, the narrower my footprint, the broader I can extend out from that. I love that limited perspective of seeing the world uh, in, a, in a myopia of sorts, uh, and then using that as, a, as a, a, you know, a springboard into something much more general. Um, my first day at SVA, School of Visual Arts in New York, Vito Conchi came in to talk to me. Um, he's a, a well-known uh, performance artist, and he gathered myself and two others in a circle, and he said, okay, who here is an artist? And my hand shot up. <laughs> I was 21. And uh, he, he dropped his glasses and he said, okay, you can leave the room. <laughs> and it was one of the best lessons I've ever had. Don't be so sure. Uh, don't be the first one to raise your hand. You never want to be the smartest one in the room. I never am. There's always someone smarter and there's always someone who can do it better than I. And that was a very important lesson to me. Um, and therein lies one of the problems I have with some of the contemporary art I see in galleries in New York City, for instance is it's, it's just too damn smart, it's too aware, it's too global, uh, it tries too hard. Um, I don't want the entire globe when I look at a painting. I can get that from the New York Times. I want one person's creepy world condensed down to the size of a diamond and then shot at my face as violently as possible. That's, that's gonna give me lucidity. That's, that's what's gonna wake me up and make me feel something. Um, so I like, again, that, that notion of, of I'm, not, I'm not advocating dumb, uninformed painting, but I am saying, tell the truth from your footprints. Tell the truth through your eyes. Uh, don't try so hard, in other words. Um, after 40 years of painting, I, I have learned that art is what happens when the intellect and the, the viscera collide at 100 miles an hour. When your brain and your heart smash into each other so violently that they make a third thing. It's kind of like when you fall in love. Your heart and your mind are smashing into each other and they constitute a third thing. Um, art, a work of art is, is part technique and part crazy. It has to have both. Too much technique, too much emphasis on concept and on, on technical things I think comes across as dry sometimes. Too much crazy without the chops to deliver that in tenable form is just crazy. So an artist has to have both. You have to find a balance between both. Consistency is what counts, in my opinion. Uh, Steve Martin said, it's easy to be great, it's hard to be good. And I, I, I believe that very much. Um, Bob Dylan once said that, uh, I want to learn how to play guitar without tricks. And I've remembered that because I think what he meant by that is, is an artist should never show the audience how much technique they possess. They should always keep a little bit of a little bit of it in reserve. 
Keep some of your chops in, in, you know, under the vest, so to speak. Don't put it all out at once. Because if you're really communicating with your audience, you only use just enough technique to tell the truth. No more and no less. If you're really communicating, the content is built into the technique. You don't need to rely on technique for technique's sake. Um, the reason I titled this show Camellia is, is because it relates to the idea of the local, of the place that I come from, uh, of, of the springtime when my mother would always put a bowl by my bed and she would fill it with water and float three camellia blossoms in the bowl. And I would just lay there on the pillow as I fell asleep and as I woke up the next morning and watched the blossoms just sort of slowly rotate and bump into each other and slowly move. And I realized all these years later that, that she was teaching me how to see. And I think that is, is a, a difference worth pointing out. Seeing is not the same thing as looking. Looking is gathering data, gathering information. Seeing is contemplation. <coughs> seeing is done in slowness. And I think that's what she was teaching me, was how to see slowly. I would lay there, it, 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 and I felt such a rage for life, watching these little flowers just move around like that. And it didn't mean a, a single thing. So I, that was important to me, and that is what I honor uh, in this show, and, and her in this show. Um, all of the paintings are double primed oil, linen, Belgian linen, very nice linen, uh, and they're primed, they're all built custom for me. Uh, they're delivered to my studio on 27th Street in Manhattan. I, I work on two solo shows a year, and it takes me about eight months to make a show. And I always have the space in mind, and I might have um, maybe a very general sense of, of a lot quality of light or, or something in the very beginning, but that's it. There are no ideas before that. And I, I work towards that single show, and at the end of eight months, I use the paintings to sort of, I take blue from here and put it there, and take you know tangerine from there and put it over here. The paintings come together in, at the same, you know, all at once, simultaneously. Um, the way that I begin is, is very much informed by Thomas Gainsborough, the, uh, the English 18th century painter, um, in that he would take the equivalent of salad tongs and he would squeeze sponges dip them in pots of black and gray, and he would lay in big masses of darks in his landscape paintings. And that's the way I begin as well. I begin with just masses of darks, some of which you can actually see. Some of them actually remain uh, until the end. And that gives me a sense of weight and gravity. It also sends light to the top, because you have dark at the bottom. And it's the very beginning of an orientation that very much relates to the way that you and I experience the world, with a bottom around your feet, a middle, right at your viscera, and then a top. So I'm very conscious of the notion of, does the bottom relate to your feet? Does the middle relate to your center and the top to your head? I like that feeling of going from bottom to top. That's also the reason I, I, I apply the paint much heavier at the bottoms and at the sides, is to underscore that notion of a firm, uh, a firm tactile, visceral foreground, something you can relate to. And the reason I, I don't start with an idea and build a painting around the idea is because for me personally, I think if, if I start with something that the viewer doesn't know, it puts an automatic distance between me and the viewer because I know something that you don't know and it's up to you to figure out what I mean by that. I prefer not working from the inside out, but I like working from the outside in. I start with things that you and I can both relate to, things that I can touch. A fistful of paint pushed onto the canvas and then my hand moves away from it. It's a thing, you, I, we can relate to it, you can touch it. Um, it does things that the real world does. Uh, if you put heavy paint, then it sags and drips. If I use thin paint, then it drips much faster. If this blue form appears to be on top of this other blue form, it's because it literally is stacked on top. I like when, when the painting operates like things do in the real world. Otherwise, it ends up feeling too much like art, and, and I, don't, I don't want that. <laughs> um, a typical day for me is I, I, I live very much within the, the confines of a routine. I like the comfort of a routine. Uh, I wake up at uh, 7.03. I, I fix, <laughs> I fix uh, breakfast for my, my children. Uh, then I walk them to school. That's my favorite thing to do in the world is walk them to school. Um, pretty soon they won't need me to anymore, but I'm st I'm, I'll figure out some way to... I'm going to buy a UPS uniform and I'll, like, I'll disguise myself. And uh, then after that, I go to the gym for 20 minutes, four days a week, and then I have breakfast with uh, four buddies of mine. We have coffee and we have like, you know, guy talk. And then I get to my studio about 10, 9.45, 10. I work on paperwork for about an hour, correspondence, and then I work after that. And I've gotten to the point after, I've been painting four years, I can just walk in and I just start. I don't, I don't prep, 
Um, it's taken a long time to get to that point, and therein I think relates back to the Bob Dylan quote. Um, uh, I don't. There are no tricks. I just. I just. It's already warmed up. I can just walk in and just start. Doesn't mean it's going to be good, but I just. I start. Um, I turned 50, as Gerald mentioned, uh, about six weeks ago, and. Uh, and it's, it's, it's caused me to go back and think a lot about heroes. Uh, who are our heroes? What does a hero provide for us? My hero is the late Canadian pianist Glenn Gould, um, whom I've studied uh, copiously in depth. Uh, and, and what he taught me was, was uh, a hero doesn't want us to copy them. Uh, don't do as I do, they tell us. Figure shit out for yourself. That's what a hero taught me. That's what Glenn Gould taught me. That, that figuring it out for yourself gradually with all the failures that come along slowly but for yourself to me is far richer than, than simply emulating someone's style. That's what he taught me. My other hero is uh, uh, much closer to home, the College Charleston professor and British painter Michael Tyzak, uh, who died in 2006, was my, my close friend, my mentor for all my time there and even after we, made, we remained close. And in 1987, I would have been a senior at the College of Charleston, uh, they invited Christo and Jean-Claude to come down. And Christo, you know, the, the great uh, environmental artist, no longer with us. Uh, they came to Charleston to do a lecture and to have an exhibition. And Michael knew Christo and said, uh, he, he took me aside and said, Brian, would you, would you drive us to the airport and pick them up? So Michael and I went to Charleston Airport. We met them at the gate, um, uh, took them downtown for fried catfish and I think sweet tea and biscuits. And, uh, and he could not have been nicer to me, Christo and Jean-Claude, especially Christo. He made eye contact, he listened to me. I was a 20-year-old twerp, nothing, you know? And he talked to me like a, like a peer. He asked me questions about my work. I asked him questions, he considered the answers, and then gave them to me. We even remained in contact when I moved to New York after. He was so very generous uh, to me, and Jean-Claude as well. A couple of months later, uh, a, a, a painter from Soho, who's actually still working, um, she has no career. Uh, she, <laughs> I'm not going to say her name, but she was she was somewhat well known then. She was in a biennial, I think, back then. She was invited down to do a talk and to have an exhibition. And Michael, of course, knew her as well, and said, "Brian, you know, come help us with the luggage. Drive me to the airport." So I did. We arrived there. Uh, from the very minute she met me, uh, she she I was like a booger on her finger. She wouldn't even look at me. You know, she, you know any question I asked her was like it, it hurt to answer it. And, you know, <laughs> So condescending, so entitled, um, and it, I didn't care. It was fine to me, and, and all that passed. And years later, you know, I, I mentioned that to Michael, and he, and he said, Brian, don't you know, you know, what I was trying to teach you there? And it, it dawned on me when he, when he described it. He said he was just trying to show me how a consummate professional treats a nobody. This is how you treat somebody, and this is how you don't treat somebody. And he taught me that by example. Uh, one was generous, and one talked to me like a human being, and gave me, you know, the dignity and the permission to kind of, you know, think about growing into myself. I was a nobody, and, and she was the opposite. Um, so to this day, uh, I answer every single email myself. I, I make time to, to speak to younger painters. I go to shows when I can. I offer advice when I'm asked. Uh, I do a series of videos on YouTube, which are which are, are heavily consumed, and I think are of use to a lot of people based on the mail that I get. Um, Tony, who's here, I know from that, several people from the videos. Um, and in them, I do kind of what I'm doing now. It's just, I sit, I pull up a chair in my studio. It's as if you were inside the camera. We crack open a couple of beers and we just talk about painting. It's very simple, one-on-one. -on -one. I do some demos in there and I do some art historical reference. Whatever's on my mind, I put it on there. It's 11 minutes long. Uh, there are 48 of them. So if you're interested, you can find them on YouTube. Um, and, and that is, is also to honor Michael, to honor that idea of trying to put something back out and to try to start a dialogue. The art world is a cutthroat, very cold, competitive place. And we need more of this, more communion. And the beauty of technology, especially YouTube, allows that to happen on a, on a, you know, on a much more broad basis. Um, I think that artists are under constant pressure to grow and change and develop in their work, which I think is art school BS. I think there's also great power and beauty in repetition, in doing one thing but getting really, really good at it over time. I always kind of uh, secretly admired, you know, birthday party magicians and lounge singers and, and traveling salesmen, people with very arduous, repetitive jobs. 
people that do something, you know, 360 shows a year, two shows a day, until they get so good at it that the delivery, the, the, the delivery is effortless. It, and I think poetry can come out when the delivery is so, so automatic. Um, so, so I've had a couple of, uh, I've been fortunate to have a couple of retrospectives in my career thus far. And what they afforded me was the opportunity to stand in a museum and look at a 25 or 35 year snapshot of my work. And I realized that I, I really only do a couple of things. <laughs> I have a couple of moves, I just learned to do them pretty well. Um, so I like that notion of repetition, of growing into something and doing it over and over until you get really good at it. Um, I think success is too often confused with popularity. Um, it's great to sell a picture or to get a review. It feels, it feels good for about 27 hours, I've found, and then it abates, that goes away. Um, it, it's, I think it's gross that a, a movie has to gross $100 million to be called successful. Um, art doesn't work that way. Art doesn't play to the arena. Uh, painting is intimate. Painting is for the backseat of a car. Painting is one-to-one. -one. It's skin-to-skin. -skin. Your skin to that skin. Um, uh, so uh, success, in my opinion, is, is measured not, not by popularity, but by curiosity and effort. Those are the things which endure, those are the things which no one can take from you, and those are the things which I believe make you 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Curiosity and effort. Um, my first shows were awful. My, my first paintings were, you know, I, I never wanted to be good, I just wanted to be less awful. Um, and I, and, but I kept going, I, I kept showing up every single day because I love to work, and at the end of the day, that's really what it is, I just love to work. Um, all the other stuff is, is fine, but I just want to go to work every day. Um, and and uh, it, it, in my opinion, an, an artist, society doesn't look for us to, to make fine, you know, sound financial decisions or to heat water or, or, uh, you know, or uh, purify water or heat air. Society doesn't use us for those things. Society relies on, on us to, to stand naked in traffic and, and tell the truth to expose ourselves, to put ourselves out, to take these risks, and in, in that, hopefully tell some truth. Um, that, I think, is our job. Fail often, but fail gloriously. And I, as I, that's what's galvanized me over the years. Um, for in the end, I think, I, think, uh, I think art fails us. I think art is incomplete. Art always lets us down. It's incomplete because it is a static, lifeless object and it requires our vitality to come to life. We project ourselves into the work of art and we bring it to life. And in return, I think it compensates us for the impermanence of life. Um, after 40 years of painting, I, I, I now realize uh, for me that, that painting comes to us bearing absolutely nothing. And expecting it or forcing it to do everything, to protest and memorialize and edify and educate, I think sometimes can weaken what it does best which is fill our remaining moments on this earth with the highest possible quality. And that's enough for me. So thank you very much. Thank you.